angular momentum. What is the angular momentum of a pool ball of mass m and radius r that is rolling without slipping at speed v? So what we've got is a pool ball, presumably on a ground. If it's rolling without slipping, it's got to be rolling on something. It has mass m, radius r, that is moving at speed v, and it's rolling without slipping. Of course, what that means is that our givens are m, r, and v, so the answer should be in terms of m, r, and v, and maybe things like g that are well-known constants. Hint, you won't need a g here. Okay, um, fine. What's its angular momentum? Well, to do that, I have to figure out two things. Um, one thing is, what am I going to measure the angular momentum about? <laughs> well, let's pick the center of the wheel, or actually, let's pick this point right here that is r above the ground, right? Just to be perverse, right? Because that was the center of the wheel a while ago. And so then the distance, or rather the displacement, which I will call capital R, of the center of mass from the reference point, right? Capital R, the displacement of the center of mass from the reference point, crossed with the momentum of the ball, and since its velocity is to the right, its momentum is the right, well, R and V are parallel, that's zero, so there is no angular momentum associated with the motion of the center of mass. So the only angular momentum I have to worry about, if it's going this way, it means it has to be rolling like that. So the, there will be an omega this way. If I define the direction it's going as X and Y is up, then looking at omega, omega's vector is into the board, so or in the negative Z direction. So I know that my angular momentum is going to be minus, in fact, I can give you the full vector, i omega z hat, right? z hat because it's into the board, and then i times omega. So I have to figure out i, and I have to figure out omega. i isn't too hard. Uh, pool ball, let's assume it's a solid, uniform solid sphere, and you can look up the angular momentum, not the angular momentum, the moment of inertia for a sphere is 2 fifths m r squared, where m is the mass of the sphere, and r is the radius of the sphere, and that's what we've got here. So we need i. So the only thing left is to figure out omega. Now this is where you say, oh, well, we have an equation, omega equals v over r, we'll just use that. And I want to caution you about just using that. Yes, this is right here, but the danger, the big danger in classes like this is, oh, I have an equation. Use the equation. Make sure you understand what the equation really says. The equation doesn't say, if I have a variable omega in my problem, and a variable v in my problem, and a variable r in my problem, they are related this way. That is not what the equation says. What the equation says is that the angular speed of an object is equal to the speed of a point on that object. And let's say the angular speed about the center of mass we'll talk about. The angular speed of an object about its center of mass, so an object sitting here rotating, is equal to speed of a point on the object a distance of r from the axis of rotation. And the axis of rotation goes through the center of mass. Right? So if I had, if I looked at, say, a disk instead of a sphere, it's rotating around this point, it's rotating in that direction, right? That guy would be going at speed v, this guy would be going at a different speed, we'll call it v2. The r I would use for this guy's speed would be the distance it is from the center, not just the radius of the object. So you always have to think about it. So let's think about it in this case. If we think about it in this case, this guy's rolling without slipping, and what that means is this point here is at rest with respect to the ground. And so this point here, the center of mass, is moving at speed v. Well, if this is moving at v relative to this, it's the same thing as saying that the whole ground and this point, along with the whole ground, is moving at speed v relative to the center of mass. Right In the center of mass's point of view, this guy's rolling and the ground is being pushed along that way. So in fact, v divided by this r really is the omega we want to use in this case. So we'll use that. So now that we know that, we can figure out the angular momentum. L vector is equal to minus 2 fifths m r squared, that's i, times v over r um, in z hat, right? It's in the minus z hat direction. I'm going to cancel one of these and these, and we're done. Minus 2 fifths m r v z hat. That is the angular momentum 
of a pool ball of mass m radius r speed v moving in the plus x direction. That's what you get, assuming the plus y direction is out. So that's the first problem. We will now go on to the second problem. And the second problem, a wheel, assume it's a ring, rolls down a hill. I know, we do this a lot, and we're still doing it. And you know where this is going, there's a theta in there somewhere, and the wheel has a mass m and a radius r. So this time it's not a sphere, it's a ring of radius r and mass m. It starts at rest and moves through a distance d down the hill. So at some time later, it will be here, where the total distance it has moved is d. And use conservation of energy to figure out the speed of the wheel after it's moved through distance d. So that says that EI is equal to EF. So we have to think, first of all, are there any external forces? And so to do that, or really, the question for conservation of energy is, are there any external forces that do work? I'm going to define X and Y that way, and then by the right-hand rule, you know, X, Y, so Z is out of the board. The forces we have are gravity, which is straight down. Right, so if, if I wanted, I could divide gravity into components, but I don't really want to. We have the normal force pushing up. And then, well, you know in this case that you're going to have a static friction force to roll without slipping. If something is rolling without slipping at a constant speed on a horizontal ground, like the pool ball from the last problem, there is no static friction there. Why? It's rolling at a constant speed, so there doesn't need to be any static friction. It, it's not... There's no angular acceleration. In this case, there is an angular acceleration. The angular acceleration, it's going to start moving that way, so there needs to be an angular acceleration into the board. So we need a torque into the board, which is going to be a, if I do the R, right, R for static friction, which is the same as the R of that, but it's in that direction, cross F, that'll be into the board, so I know there's static friction that way. Now, if I look at which of these forces could do work, well, Let's measure angular momentum about the center of the ball, or sorry, uh, kinetic energy, uh, ro rotational kinetic energy. We'll measure it about the center of the ball. Um, gravity has no lever arm, so um, that's not relevant. Gravity is doing work, but the real reason is, is that we're going to track gravity with potential energy, so we don't have to worry about it, right? Yes, gravity is doing work, but we have gravitational potential energy, so we're good with that. Normal force is perpendicular to the direction of motion, so it does not do work, right? Remember, the work done by the normal force would be the force dotted with the displacement it goes through. The displacement is along x, the normal force is along y, the dot product of two perpendicular vectors is zero. So that's zero. But then the static friction, and this is the subtle one I talked to you about on the previous video, sure looks like it's doing work. But if you look really close, the static friction is with the contact point, and the contact point itself is not doing work. Now, a little while later, the contact point will have moved down a little bit, and it's a new point that static friction is with. But at this one instant, this point is at rest, the force is that way, and so the point on which the force is exerted is not moving, so this force doesn't do work. So it's not how much does the whole ball move, but how much does the point where the force is being exerted move. So static friction does no work because of that, so we have conservation of energy. So given that we have conservation of energy, we can use it to figure it out. So the initial potential energy plus the initial kinetic energy has to equal the final potential energy plus the final kinetic energy. Let's pick where it is at the end. Let's pretend, well, here, I'll just do this. We'll pick where it is at the end is what we're going to call zero. And that is the height it starts at. So the initial potential energy is just mgh. Initial kinetic energy is zero. The final potential energy is zero because we chose that zero to be there. Plus, we have one half mv squared plus one half i omega squared. And for all the reasons I talked about in the last problem about rolling without slipping, omega will in fact be v over r. And this is a ring, so i is just mr squared. So we know those two. And then finally h, well this distance from here to here is d, so opposite over hypotenuse is sine. So we have mg, let me write it a little lower so it'll fit, 
mg times d sine theta is equal to one half mv squared plus one half times i, which is mr squared, times omega, which is v over r squared. So the r squared will cancel that r squared. So I have one half mv squared plus one half mv squared. M g d sine theta is equal to mv squared, or v is equal to the square root of g d sine theta. All right, that's part A. That's how fast it's going at the bottom, as figured out from conservation of energy. B, what is the angular momentum of the wheel after it's moved through a distance d? Let's measure angular momentum around the center of the wheel so that there is no, uh, you know, the wheel is moving now at speed v, and that's what v is. But there's no angular momentum, because remember, angular momentum, there's no angular momentum of the center of mass, so the angular momentum of the center of mass is RCM cross VCM, right, times M, should be, I'll just write it as the momentum P, you know, we get P is mass times V, so P is in the same direction as V, well, RCM is zero, because we're measuring it from the center of mass. So there's none of that, so all we have, then, I'll do the magnitude first, and we'll talk about the direction in a moment, the magnitude is going to be equal to I times omega, and we've already argued, well, we've already argued that I is MR squared, and omega we've argued is v over r, so that's going to be g d sine theta over r. So the angular momentum is m times r times the square root of g d sine theta, and it is now all in terms of givens. d is a given, uh, m is a given, r is a given. So that's the magnitude of the angular momentum. Now the direction, well we know it's going this way, Right? It's rolling like that to go down the hill. So it's rolling that way, that's into the board, which is opposite z. So I'm going to go ahead and just say, now that I know the direction, I'm going to just put this in the negative z hat direction. And now I know the angular momentum of this wheel. C, use your answer to part A to figure out how long it took the wheel to go through distance d. So here's my answer to part A. How do we do this? Well, this is kinematics back from the first stuff we did in the class. How long did it take to go through distance d? Well, what did we have? We know that it went through distance d. So the final distance is equal to, so that's really sort of an xf. In fact, I'll just write down the equation I'm using as xf equals x0 plus 1 half v0 xt plus 1 half axt squared, right? Well, OK, good. Um, so we're doing just, this is the x component of that vector equation. So I'm going to define x equals 0 here. xf is d. x starts at 0. v0, x is 0 because it starts at rest. It's just 1 half axt squared. So t is going to equal 2d over ax. But what is ax? It is not g sine theta or g cosine theta because there's also this force of friction. But we can just use kinematics to find this out because we know the final v, and we know that vx is going to equal v0x plus ax times t, right? And I know the final vx is root g d sine theta is equal to ax times t, right? So ax is just equal to root g d sine theta all over t. And now I know this ax. And I'm like, oh, but what is I don't know it. I don't know t. Yeah, but I can substitute it in here. This is going to be a little bit ugly. And I can get t. In fact, I'm going to leave it as t squared. That will make it less ugly. t is equal to 2d divided by ax. So when I divide by 1 over t, that will become a t in the numerator with a g d sine theta here, right? And so now I can divide both sides by t. What is the question I'm after? Figure out the time. And so now I know the time. I'm going to write it down here so I can use it later. So the time is just equal to 2. And notice also I have a d divided by square root of d. So I'm going to divide that square root of d out just end like this. Square root of d divided by g sine theta. That's the time it took. Let's think about units meters per second squared in the denominator, 
meters in the numerator, so the meters cancel. So I have 1 over second squared in the denominator, which is the same as second squared in the numerator. It's under a square root. I get seconds. Good. The units are right. I see people looking at me, so I'm going to go answer my door. All right, it was just a psychology student trying to find a way to creep people out. You know, that's what they do. Okay, uh, use your answer to parts B and C to figure out the torque on the wheel. What is the force giving this torque? Oh, well, torque. There are various ways you can think about torque. You can think about torque as uh, R cross F. So I could figure out the torque on the wheel by doing R cross F for all of these, and I'll get a torque from static friction. I don't know static friction. I know that torque is going to be I times alpha. Maybe I could figure out the angular acceleration. And I know the moment of inertia. But that wouldn't be using B and C. There's another way I can do it, because here's my answer to B. Here's my answer to C. Right? This is the amount of time it took. So that's also right. That that's the time interval it took to go from L equals zero to that, right? And I can use this thing we learned in class, that torque is equal to delta L over delta T. And I know that delta L is this minus zero, so minus M R root G D sine theta Z hat divided by, and here's our delta T, 2 times the square root of d over g sine theta, and now I have the torque. But let's simplify it. So to simplify it, I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of g sine theta. Right? You can always multiply the top and bottom of a fraction by the same thing. So that will cancel here. g sine theta times g sine theta under square root, so it becomes just g sine theta. Notice I also have a square root of d on the top and a square root of d on the bottom. So when that is done, I get minus m r times g sine theta all divided by 2 z hat. That is the torque. That's our answer to part d. Pretty exciting, huh? And then finally, oh, what is the force giving this torque? Well, if you think about torques about the center of mass here, because right, it's getting it spun up around the center of mass. Um, well, we already said the normal force has no torque because the displacement from the pivot point, which we're choosing, is the center of mass, or the reference point. The displacement to where the force acts is that way. The force is that way. They're anti-parallel, so the cross product is going to be zero. Gravity, there is no lever arm, so the only one is static friction. So static friction is the force doing that. And so finally, Use your answer to parts B and C. Think instead about acceleration and angular acceleration. Calculate the torque on the wheel. Do you get a consistent answer? Ooh, so now I want to use this one. So let's think about acceleration and angular acceleration. So acceleration, so now I really do. So first of all, I know this is theta, right? Because vertical, perpendicular, horizontal along minus y is going to be perpendicular to x, right? So those are, that angle will be the same as that angle. So that means that this component is mg sine theta. So the mass of the ball times the acceleration in the x direction is equal to mg sine theta minus fsf. g sine theta minus fsf. I know that the magnitude of the torque is RSF, which is just R, times FSF. And that torque is going to equal I, which is MR squared, times alpha. And finally, because of all the rolling without slipping stuff, I know that alpha is just going to be equal to A over R. So I'm going to substitute that in here, A over R. Um, so what happens is, is the R's cancel. No, they don't. Well, they do. If I divide both sides by R, let's do it like this. I get R squared, then the R squared is canceled, right? And so FSF is equal to MA. This might start to sound like a video problem from last week or last time around, because it is. So I get MA, right, AX, let's just call it A because we know it's entirely in the X direction, is equal to MG sine theta minus FSF. 
Uh, right, so therefore an FSF is MA, or 2MA is equal to MG sine theta, or A is equal to G sine theta over 2. And so now I can go and figure out what is the torque. Well, now that I know FSF, right, because I know A, I can just weep openly about my horrible word management. So calculating it another way, I know that the torque of static friction, just the magnitude, is going to be R times FSF. And FSF is R, is the same as MA, times M times G sine theta over 2. And hey, look, I get the same thing. So if I just started by thinking about angular accelerations and accelerations doing F equals MA, I get the same torque as if I start by thinking about energy and angular momentum. So there's multiple paths sometimes to work out the same answer. Anyway, that is the second problem. One to go. Do you like my little interpretive dance? In a dramatic and exciting chase scene, James Bond, a fictional British spy of Mass M. By the way, before you ask, no, I have not seen the new James Bond movie yet. So James Bond is a British spy of Mass M, because everything is a Mass M. He's going to jump off a building. I should have made it Sherlock, right, if you've seen the second season of that show. So here he is. He's on a building. And he's going to jump off, because James Bond does stuff like that. It's just part of his deal. Um, and the idea is he's going to jump and fall straight down, so I don't have to worry about lateral motion. Um, then he's going to land on a Ferris wheel, because why not? So here's a Ferris wheel, which is fixed in place here. There's some sort of pylon thing holding it in place. And there's a chair. And if you look at this, there's a whole bunch of little chairs. But there's a chair in the Ferris wheel. He's going to hit the Ferris wheel. And then the Ferris wheel, which starts at rest, and the Ferris wheel has mass capital M and radius, I bet you know what it is, R, who is surprised by that. Um, the building is height H. James Bond is mass M. And when he hits the wheel, it's going to uh, cause this thing to start rotating. And we have to figure all the deals out. So let's figure out all the deals. If you consider the system to be Bond, the Ferris wheel, and the gravitational potential energy between Bond and the Earth, right, so it's Bond and the Ferris wheel, and then we're going to include gravitational potential energy. So the Earth isn't really part of the system, but we'll use gravitational potential energy as usual. Which of momentum, angular momentum about the center of the wheel and energy is conserved as Bond falls from the top of the building to the chair? So we want to ask first, momentum, angular momentum, or angmom as I like to call it, and really, because we know energy is always conserved, but within our system is mechanical energy conserved? In fact, all of these are always conserved, but which of these are conserved within our system? Well. Let's think about what forces we have on the system. Uh, so the building's not part of the system, but once James Bond has jumped, so he has jumped and he is now falling, so he's there. So if you look at James Bond, there is exactly one force on him. We are ignoring air resistance, we have FGB, force of gravity on Bond. On the Ferris wheel, we have a couple of forces. We have force of gravity on Ferris wheel, FGW. There's also going to be a normal force of at the pivot where it's being held up, pushing upwards. And those are the only forces on that. So which of these are external forces? Well, force of gravity is an external force. Um, that is going to break momentum conservation because we've got this external force of gravity. So momentum is not going to be conserved because we've got we're not keeping track of the momentum of the Earth as it comes up towards Bond. A tiny, tiny, tiny amount. We've calculated this now. So that's an external force that ruins momentum conservation. So momentum, no, not conserved. Angular momentum, are there any external torques? Oh, well, let's think about the, this is huge James Bond here, right? The Ferris wheel, we want to measure torques about that as our reference point. So both of the normal force and the gravitational force of the wheel, which is at the center of the Ferris wheel here, both of those are, um, what am I trying to say? Both of these have no lever arm, so no torque, but the force of gravity on James Bond has some lever arm. That's actually basically the radius of the wheel, because he's going to end right at the edge of the wheel. So I should have drawn him closer. But there is a lever arm, and it is not perpendicular, right? So that is an external torque. So no, we say gravity is an external force. Uh, 
Um, so is the normal force for that matter. Gravity not is, but gives an external torque. So angular momentum will not be conserved while James Bond is falling. Finally, what about mechanical energy? And the question is, do any of the external forces do work? Well, gravity on Bond is certainly doing work because he's moving that way and the force is that way, but we are tracking gravity with potential energy. So we don't have to worry, that's good. We're keeping track of gravity. The normal force on the Ferris wheel is an external force, but it does no work because the center of the Ferris wheel doesn't move. So yes, this is conserved, no external forces, Right, because really gravity sort of isn't an external force because we have gravitational potential energy. So the normal force is the only external force, the normal force on the wheel there, and it doesn't do any work. So while he's falling, mechanical energy is conserved. That's good, so we can use that. Next, in the collision with James Bond and the chair, what's going to be conserved. So I'm going to draw this again. Here's the Ferris wheel. Here's the chair and we go from just before to James Bond in the chair. What a mess. Let me try and draw that again. So we're going to go from before where he's just above the chair and now after I will draw in red when he's in the chair. Okay, what is conserved here? So we have the same forces. We have gravity on Bond I'm going to draw it a little off to the side. We have gravity on the wheel, and we have the normal force of however the pivot, whatever it is that's, that, that's holding up the center of the wheel, there's going to be a force upwards. So I'll call that a normal force. It may not exactly be a normal force, but it's probably something like that. Okay, we have to ask all the same questions. But now, because this is a collision, we might have a short delta T. So we also have to think about momentary isolation. So let's start with momentum. Okay, well there's going to be forces between Bond and the chair as they interact on each other, but they're both part of the system, so internal forces are never a problem. Remember, with momentary isolation, the force of gravity on Bond is just going to be the mass of Bond, which is just a little m times g. Right, so the, um, the impulse is just going to be mg times delta t, and if delta t is short enough, hey, that's excellent. Likewise, gravity on the wheel, same thing. That'll be capital M times G. It's bigger, but if delta T is short enough, the impulse is very small. And so gravity will, will allow us to have momentary isolation. But there's this problem. That's the normal force of the wheel. The normal force of the wheel, if I draw a free body diagram just for the wheel by itself, right? I have force of gravity on the wheel, normal force on the wheel, and the force of bond pushing on the wheel. Now this is internal to the system, but okay, the normal force on the wheel is equal to, because the wheel neither moves up nor down, so this has to balance both of these, Fg plus force of bond on wheel, and this force, if you think about it, he has to hit the wheel and stop. So the total impulse that, that um, is going to, that the force of bond on the wheel is going to do is going to be however much momentum he had. If the delta T goes down, the force has to go up so that the impulse stays the same, so it can take all this momentum down, right? So if it's a big squishy chair, it goes and comes to a stop, not much force, long time. But if it's a hard chair, he hits it fast, big force. So this force, force of bond on the wheel goes up as delta T goes down, which means the normal force is going to do the same thing. So we do not even have momentary isolation because of the normal force of the pivot on the wheel is going to break momentum conservation. So we do not have momentum conservation. Now, so now let's think about angular momentum conservation. Ang mom. And so now what we have to think about is during the collision, are there any external torques that do a significant or generate a significant impulse? Well, all right. So the, the delta L the impulse from a torque is going to be that torque times delta T. So let's think about the three external forces we have. Again, there's a force of bond pushing on the chair and the chair pushing on bond, but those are internal torques between parts of the system, so that's fine. That's not an external torque. We don't care about that. I mean, we care, 
It's exchanging annual momentum within the system, but it's not external to the system. So the three external forces are the two forces on the Ferris wheel, but both of those, here's our reference point, so both of those have no lever arm and therefore exert no torque at all. Hooray! The force of gravity on James Bond does exert a external torque, however, right? So the lever arm in this case is capital R, because he's right at the edge of the Ferris wheel. So that's going to be F of gravity on Bond times capital R, the magnitude of the torque, because they're perpendicular. So the magnitude of the torque is the product of those two times delta T. But notice, as delta T goes down, this gets little. So angular momentum is, yes, conserved momentarily, because um, all external torques uh, do vanishing, do uh, dinky, let's go ahead and use do dinky delta L for dinky delta T. All right. If I was doing torques about this point, it wouldn't work, because the same thing, remember F of the normal force on the wheel goes up as delta T goes down. That was the problem we had before. So in this case, angular momentum is conserved, right? That's, that was the problem we had here with linear momentum. But because this one thing that goes up as the delta T goes down, right? So this is the thing that breaks linear momentum, has no lever arm, so it doesn't break angular momentum. And then finally, energy is not conserved. Mechanical energy is not conserved because it's an inelastic collision, right? We just know that because two things stuck to each other. James Bond stuck. He, he has gum all over his butt. It's pretty rude, but he does. And so he sticks to the chair. So that's going to be an inelastic. Maybe there's gum all over the chair. Oh, no, it's it's spilled. Uh, yeah, what's that stuff that's uh, poofy and it's all sugar? Uh, why can I not remember this name? It's like cotton candy. There's cotton candy all over the chair. And he <laughs> sticks into it, and then he never gets out of this chair ever again. He starves to death after this, except he eats the cotton candy, so he's fine. So... Um, it's an inelastic collision, so mechanical energy is not conserved. So in this collision, only angular momentum is conserved. So then finally, I ask the question, how long does it take to reach the ground after he jumps? Because what's going to happen, he's going to jump, he's going to hit here, and then the Ferris wheel is going to rotate and bring him to the ground. So the idea is, he's like, I'm going after the bad guy. Jump. Run, 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 run. That's what he's going to do. So let's do the calculations. Figure out what happens. Well, all right, so how long does it take him to reach the ground? Well, first thing is, how long does it take him to fall from here to here? So that's going to be old-fashioned kinematics, actually. So let's do the old-fashioned kinematics. Let's define x that way, y that way, and z that way. He's only moving in the y direction, so we say y is equal to y0 plus v0yt plus 1 half a y t squared, standard kinematic equation there. He's going straight down. We want to know when does he get to height r, right? So the Ferris wheel just barely grazes above the ground. So that height is r. He starts at height h, right? Um, he has no initial speed, because he's, he's actually not really jumping, he's sort of stepping off. And then gravity is minus g, right? It's g and it's down, or minus g t squared. So r minus h is equal to minus one half g t squared. Multiply both sides by negative two. I get two times h minus r, right? At the negative, I just reverse the, what do you call that thing? Subtraction, the order of the subtraction, is equal to t squared. So if I take a square root, that's the time it takes. And so we'll call this t is how long it takes um, to go from h to r. So we could calculate that number, and I will. Next, how long does it take him to rotate there? Well, to know that, we have to know what is the angular velocity or the angular speed of the Ferris wheel after he hits it. How can we figure that out? We can use um, angular momentum conservation. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say that LF is equal to LI. Now, by LI, I'll draw my initial condition, is James Bond falling at some speed we'll call V, that's his speed at this time. And then LF is going to be the combination of James Bond and the Ferris wheel rotating at some omega. So we're going to have I, which we'll have to figure out, times omega um, is going to equal. And remember, if you have something moving in a straight line, 
and it is perpendicular, the angular momentum of a thing moving in a straight line is just going to be r in the plus x hat direction, right, because that's x hat, crossed v in the minus y hat direction, okay, um, times his mass, because it's really r cross momentum. So multiply m by v to get the mass. That'll be the angular momentum. So x cross y is going to be z, so that will be minus m r v in the z hat direction. And then notice it ends up rotating in the minus z hat direction anyway. So I'll just worry about the fact this is the final angular momentum in the minus z hat direction. So the initial in the minus z hat direction is m r v. But what is v? Well, there's two ways I could figure that out. I could figure out from the kinematics, because I know t, and so I could just multiply a by t. In fact, I'm just going to do that. We know that vy, which is the same as that v, is equal to v0y, which is 0, um, plus a times t. Really, it's, we'll say vy is equal to 0 minus gt, and then we'll take the magnitude to get that v. So that's going to be 0 minus root 2g h minus r, right, because I multiply g here, I'll have to cancel and move it inside the square, it'll be g squared, cancel one of those, I'll end up with this. Okay, so therefore the magnitude, the speed is just root 2gh minus i, the y component is negative, the speed is just positive. What is i? Well, all right, I'm going to do a thing here. Notice that James Bond's mass is 70 kilograms, and the mass of the Ferris wheel is 6.4 times 10 to the 4 kilograms. So the, the Ferris wheel is three orders of magnitude. So you need three significant figures to even be able to tell that James Bond was there in addition to the Ferris wheel. So I'm just going to ignore James Bond's mass when the Ferris wheel is rotating. So we're going to say i, because the Ferris wheel we're pretending is a ring, is just going to be m times r squared. Now really, I should also add little m. In fact, you know what? It's not so hard. I'll just do it. Little m r squared, because James Bond is like a point mass, a distance capital R away. So that's our moment of inertia. So let's substitute these things back in over here, and we will get that omega, I'm going to divide both sides by i also, is equal to m times r times root 2g times h minus r, that's v substituted in, divided by i, which is capital m plus little m times capital R squared. So I can divide one of those r's with that. Now I know omega. How long, now that I know omega, I can figure out, well, he needs to rotate through a delta theta. Well, so delta theta over delta t is equal to omega. And delta, so delta t, so delta theta by delta t is omega. So delta t is equal to brain death. Delta theta by omega. Now the delta theta he needs, he has to go through one quarter of a rotation to get to the bottom. So that's 90 degrees of delta theta, and omega will stay constant. There's no external torques once he's in there. Actually, there is because he's a little off to the edge in gravity. Right, let's not worry about that. So um, the, uh, the delta theta is going to be 90 degrees. So that's pi over 2, because we need to do radians here. So we have pi over 2 is delta theta, and I have to divide by omega. So the denominator of omega will come up to the numerator, m plus m times r, and then down in the denominator we get an m times root 2g times h minus r. So the total time to go from the top is going to be the sum of this and this, right? The time for him to fall plus that time. So let's work those out and do the numbers and see what we get. So I will copy these two up here so I can erase the rest. So the, the total time is going to be 2 times h minus capital R over g plus pi times capital M plus lowercase m times r divided by 2 times m times the square root of 2 times g times h minus r. It's worth making sure the units are right. So I have meters, and then there'll be meters in g because it's meters per second squared. So I'm left with seconds squared and the denominator of the denominator, so it's second squared in here, square root, that one's good. This one, the mass, we'll cancel that mass. I have a meters times meters under the square root, we'll cancel this meter, so I have the same thing. I have a g under the denominator at the bottom, that'll be one over second squared. Under a square root, it'll become seconds in the numerator. So the units work, so now let's plug in the numbers. So that's the square root of 2 
I don't have to look at what the numbers are. H is 32 meters. Capital R is 12 meters. G is 9.8 meters per second squared. Plus pi times capital M is 6.4 times 10 to the fourth kilograms plus 70 kilograms. Capital R is 12 meters. I already looked that up. Divided by 2 times 70 kilograms times the square root of 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared times 32 minus 12 meters. I am going to stick that in my calculator. So having put that in my calculator, I'm going to erase this because I've copied out there. I'm going to show you the two pieces separately. Is uh, This gives you, well, to the number, of, to the decimal place where it'll matter, is two seconds plus, are you ready for this? 871 seconds. So that's like, well, to the number of sig figs I have, I only have two sig figs here, so it's going to be 870 seconds, which is just about 30, min 30 seconds short of 15 minutes. So think about this in a movie. You have the Ferris wheel. James Bond jumps down. Yeah, two seconds. Oh my god, falling, 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 hits. And it slowly rotates over the course of 15 minutes. This is no longer a James Bond movie. This is now an art film, which means you can feel superior for watching it because you're watching a deep, important movie with meanings that is boring. So anyway, the real important thing about that is thinking about the energy conservation and the angular momentum conservation. So I hope you got something out of that. Go watch Spectre, it's probably more exciting.